Okay, thanks very much. So my name is Simon Neal. I'm from the School of Ocean Sciences, Bangor. Uh, my other two uh, institutional leads on the on the um, project are <coughs> masters, uh, Swans University. He's in the audience, and Daphne O'Doherty uh, from Cardiff University. She's here today as well. Okay, so this is our project. It's called Quotient. Not quite sure what Quotient means, but it's an acronym that stands for this. So it's quantification, optimization, and envir environmental impacts of marine renewable energy. Okay, I would just like to thank the funders of so the, um, the NRN, uh, the Carbon Energy and Environment, funded through FP and the Welsh Government. I would also like to recognise the support of HPC Wales, and Laura's here today representing HPC Wales. It's very much a computational project. Okay, so why are we bothering with marine renewables? So there have been recent um, fluctuations in energy prices. So if you go in and try to fill up at the petrol pump just now, it's at a, um, sort of a, a localised um, uh, low in the price. And there have been recent uh, reassessments of global fossil fuel resources, for example, uh, the discovery of shale gas, which the Americans are very much tapping into now. However, despite this, the world's hydrocarbons are a finite resource. And we have targets, so the UK government has a target of 15% renewables by 2020. Climate change, as you've heard um, extensively today, is a real issue that we're faced with. And again, we have legally binding um, carbon dioxide emission targets. And also, uh, development of marine renewables is consistent with um, uh, the development of a high-tech UK industry. Okay, so there, there is motivation for um, studying such things. So we're interested in waves and tides for our marine renew renewables, so waves first. Um, so this is a plot sort of thing that we produce, but this is from some other uh, researchers. And it's the global wave resource. So you can see an awful lot of the resources in the southern oceans. So it's not very practical to try and generate electricity from uh, somewhere uh, so remote from population centers. But a lot of the, um, the wave energy is based around the shelf seas, so for example the Northwest European Shelf, where we're based, and this is um, uh, technically exploitable by current technology. So they, they reckon um, about 5% of this resource um, is extractable with our current technology. Okay, and tides, um, this, these are maps, these are using different um, products. But these are uh, uh, maps of global tidal dissipation. And global tidal dissipation is two terawatts, but the same as the, uh, the wave resource in the previous slide. So it's a huge resource, and most tidal dissipation tends to take place on continental shelves. And so again, it's matched to where the demand centers are. Okay, so it's another uh, quite useful, so it's a very large amount of electricity, or potential for uh, generating electricity, and it's very much uh, matched to the uh, demand centers. Okay, so how can we um, make use of waves and tides to generate electricity? And that's through uh, devices like these. So the, the one on the top left here, uh, not the best example in the world because I went to, into administration in November last year. It's now owned by the um, Scottish government, so it will continue in some form. But this is the Palamas uh, device. Uh, an awful lot of amount of steel in a device like this, so it's possibly one of the reasons it went into admin. Uh, this is another type of device, uh, Power Boy. Uh, this uh, can handle waves coming from all directions, whereas a device like this needs to be aligned uh, perpendicular to the uh, wave propagation. Okay, so those are wave devices, wave energy devices. Uh, these ones, rail devices, this is in Stratford Narrow. Uh, Stratford Narrow is in Northern Ireland, near where, quite near where I'm from. Uh, so this is a real grid-connected device generating meaningful amounts of electricity. And uh, this is a Welsh device. This is Tide Energy Limited device sitting in uh, Milford Haven Dock just now, ready to deploy. And all manufactured in Wales, this device. Okay, so these are devices. And of course, uh, single devices uh, will not generate meaningful amounts of electricity. There will have to be a raise of devices, so large arrays of devices in the future. It's very much a, a growth industry. Okay, but tides and waves are both intermittent. Okay, but. Um, a sort of footnote here just to remind myself that tides are highly predictable. Okay, so we can uh, 
fairly high accuracy of, um, um, a fairly high accuracy, we can say with the tide today, maybe 100 years or so from now. So that's uh, the tidal elevations and the tidal currents. Uh, waves, of course, not so predictable. They have seasonal trends, but there's an awful lot of interannual variability within the wave resource. Okay, but they're high density source of energy, uh, and a lot of the resource tends to be fairly close to population centers, so where the um, energy could actually be uh, consumed. And it's been suggested the wave and tidal could deliver up to 27 gigawatts. This is for the UK of installed capacity by 2050. However, we're only a very, very small amount of, um, of the web on this uh, roadmap, so we've only got 7 megawatts um, installed so far. But if uh, marine energy deploys globally, so the UK is the world leader in marine energy, um, not just from the research perspective, but from the, um, the device and technology perspective. Uh, so if it deploys globally, the UK could capture up to, very broad estimates, up to 4 billion um, pounds of uh, uh, a contribution to UK uh, GDP, and again this is by 2050. Okay, so there's an awful lot of um, potential here for wave and tidal. So our cluster quotient, um, so our big aim is to understand the role that marine renewables could have in the future energy mix. And we intend to address this through four themes, four research themes. So research assessment, uh, I'll go over some of these themes in a little bit more detail, just uh, get lots of colour images. Optimization, so two scales, large scale and array scale optimization. Environmental impacts, so if you put arrays of these in the environment, how do they affect the environment? But also the reverse, how does the environment um, affect devices like this? So turbulence and loading on structures. Okay, so that's our four major themes. Uh, Let's look at something to do with resource assessment first. This is uh, some very recent uh, wave simulations we've been doing of the RSC, very high resolution simulations. Uh, just to highlight the um, importance of a uh, project like HPC Wales. Um, uh, if I was to run a simulation like this uh, on a single process, which is so just running a simulation like this in, um, in series, it would take me about 34 years for each decade of my simulation. So we do tend to do um, sort of decadal or multi-decadal type simulations. So it's a huge, um, well, I mean, it would probably take me into retirement, I think, before even my first simulation had finished. But uh, through something like HPC Wales, it takes maybe three, four weeks or something to do a simulation for a decade. We're still very impatient and we uh, always trying to push the boundaries. But if we didn't have a resource like HPC Wales, I think we'd just have to go to course of resolution, spatially, temporally, and spectrally. So there's a lot less that we could actually achieve with such a facility. Okay, but um, a couple of things of interest in this are the, uh, the demonstration zones so from a Welch perspective. So this is the, uh, the Pembrokeshire wave demonstration zone, at least by the Crown Estate. Okay, so you can see that we're sort of resolving spatially the waves around a site like this, and resolving over long time periods. So this is a potential wave resource because uh, although this is just a uh, November, December mean uh, wave power. This by the way is in kilowatts per meter. So if you sort of think about this, this is uh, 25 to 30 kilowatts per meter. So just per meter of wave crest. So it's a huge amount of uh, power could be generated if you, if you could actually tap it. Okay, so that's the uh, Pembrokeshire demo zone and in North Wales we've got this uh, I think it's called the West Whale or the West Anglesey demo zone. That's a tidal demo zone. But of course, even though the, the waves seem fairly quiescent here, this is just a mean. And we do have quite a lot of wave events. So it's important for the tidal industry to actually understand waves as well. So um, a lot of our research tends to be to do with uh, wave current interaction. So how the waves modulate the tidal resource and uh, vice versa. Okay. So intermittency is one of the issues that we're addressing in this uh, cluster. So it's just some analysis I did fairly recently. So it's uh, the red uh, color is the waves, and it's just showing uh, different frequencies of waves when you analyze uh, sort of decadal or multi-decadal um, timescales of simulation. And the waves have a very high 
um, intra-annual variability in the resource. It's a very and also a very strong um, seasonal um, intermittency. The tides, extremely predictable, but again, they're intermittent. Uh, the two scales of most importance are uh, this quarter diurnal, so that's four tides per day, so it's the springs and leaps, or so, sorry, the, the floods and ebbs, which happen um, four times per day. And also the fortnightly time scale, so this is a real uh, problem with the tide energy industry, is that um, every two weeks we have neat tides, and this occurs globally. So there's uh, very real issues to do with that um, time scale intermittency. Okay, so we think we need um, a combined solution of waves, tides, and of course other energy resources to address this intermittency. Okay, so two slides ago was waves, and this is tides. So this is uh, Northwest European Shelf. And it's just showing the um, amplitude of the current. It's just for one of the astronomical constituents, but if you add more of them, it will just uh, change the, the magnitude. So it still have the same distribution. And it's just showing the hotspots around the Northwest European Shelf. So a big winner is the uh, Pendant Firth, huge resource here, and Orkney. So there's uh, quite a lot of test centers, and test sites around Orkney. Uh, Channel Islands, uh, all the new races down here, uh, places in the English Channel like Portland Bill. But you see that within Wales itself, uh, northwest of Anglesey, the Skerries, the Clean Peninsula, and the west of uh, Pembrokeshire, so especially around Ramsey Sound, is a huge resource. Okay. And with the possible exception of the, the Clean, all reasonably well uh, positioned for grid connections, which is not the same for Scotland. So Scotland uh, and the Firth is quite far from a, a grid connection. <coughs> There's really a spare grid capacity up here for, um, for tidal. Okay, so uh, one of the issues that we're interested in through this cluster and through previous research is tidal phasing. So uh, this uh, sort of tangled looking, with lots of circuits and wires, is if I take uh, the whole of the Northwest European shelf and we can construct a time series of the uh, tidal currents for all the high tidal energy sites. So it's everywhere where, uh, that's a scientific definition, but it's where the M2, which is the, um, the lunar uh, constituent of the tide, where that current amplitude exceeds 1.7 meters per second. So we'll just say everywhere is where it's a very high tidal stream. And you can see that you get this pattern. So. Uh, Everything seems to be in phase, or else exactly out of phase, so 180 degrees out of phase. But actually, when it comes to power extraction, um, when this site, or these range of sites, are in their peak flood, so the peak <coughs> flood current, then these sites are in their peak ebb. So actually, when the power is generated, if we assume that the device um, extracts uh, kinetic energy equally between the flood and the ebb phase of the tide, the resulting power is actually in phase. Uh, so you see that all the high tidal stream sites are reasonably well in phase whenever it comes to the power generated by these. So if we try and aggregate this, it's gonna create a big problem with intermittency into the electricity network. So it's a bit of a problem with just considering tides alone for just these high uh, tidal stream sites. So uh, something we're working on is to try and uh, suggest a road map to try and and uh, maximize the phase diversity. So I'm trying to choose sites which are complementary in phase and also take consideration of the amplitude to have sort of long-term um, uh, roadmaps for, for growth in the industry. Uh, the solution to this could well be by going to lower tidal stream sites which tend to offer uh, uh, more phase diversity than just uh, um, considering the very high uh, tidal stream sites which the Crown Estate currently, currently leases. Okay, so that's a large scale optimization, but we're also uh, dealing with array scale optimization in the cluster. So a single device is not going to be uh, that useful for the UK, so we need uh, arrays of devices. And the questions are, where do you place these devices once they're in arrays? So this isn't uh, too much of a problem in the wind industry because the, uh, the atmosphere, um, you know, uh, there's no real upper bound in the atmosphere when it comes to a wind turbine. But when it comes to the um, ocean environment and you're constrained by maybe 40 meters water depth, clearly the position of an array downstream for another is going to uh, create a very uh, a real wake effect. 
Okay, so there's different strategies you can do. So they, they tend to use a staggering type technique where the wake of this one uh, uh, will not uh, influence uh, the power that's extracted from these other um, devices downstream. So there's lots of optimization strategies at a ray scale. And uh, this sort of uh, is achieved through uh, what we call CFD. So the modeling I showed was oceanographic modeling. This is CFD, computational fluid dynamic modeling. Uh, this is using a blade element momentum method to represent the, uh, the rotors or the, the turbines as disks. Okay, so it's a sort of intermediate complexity um, solution. And results from array optimizations and energy extractions like this can be used to uh, parameterize oceanographic scale models. So we can actually um, input arrays of devices into oceanographic models and see what impact this would have on the environment. So I've just shown it here for the, the change to the residual velocity field. And other research in this area applies this to sediment dynamics. So if you had a sandbank here, how would the sandbank be affected by the um, long-term operation of a, a tidal energy farm? Okay, in this case here, you can see that we've actually ended up in, although there's a deficit of velocity here, we've increased the velocity uh, close to the coastline of Alderney, and it could actually have implications on coastal erosion. Okay, so trying to minimize these sorts of effects by giving uh, some sort of uh, guidance as to siting of arrays. Okay, and the, so I said the, the other CFD model was um, intermediate complexity. This is the, the one with the high computational cost. So this is the blade resolving um, CFD models where we actually look at things like the fluid structure interaction. So for example, the, um, the effect of the fluid on the blades and the effect of the, um, the support column of the structure on the blades and the resource itself. Okay, so this is hugely computationally intensive. Uh, so again, results from this would be used to parameterize the intermediate scale CFD models, the array scale models, which could then be used to uh, parameterize the oceanographic models. So we're, we're sort of simulating across the range of scales, everything from uh, the rotation of an actual uh, turbine blade up to uh, the European shelf and decadal scale simulations. <coughs> okay, so this is my final slide. Uh, so it's a multidisciplinary, so it's science and engineering. Uh, cluster will conduct world leading marine renewable energy research on the four themes of research assessment, optimization at shelf scale and, and array scale, environmental impacts and impacts of the environment on devices. And that's me, thank you. Thank you.